trust I'm going to do. Lord, I thank you for your presence here this morning. I pray, Lord, that you just anoint my mind and my lips to bring forth the words you have us to hear, Lord, and that they would take root in our hearts and our minds, that we may remember them throughout the week, but even greater than that, that they become part of us, Lord, that we are transformed into your image even farther. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Doubting disciples. I want to focus on that first part. But without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him. According to Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, it defines doubt as to lack confidence in distrust, or to consider unlikely. To lack confidence in, distrust, or consider unlikely. On a side note, as we're going through four, I don't think any of us would say that we distrust God. Do we ever look at things, and even if we ask them, Consider it unlikely. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. But what is faith? Well, faith is the complete opposite of doubt. The, I love it when scripture interprets scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. If we would start studying that verse and the definition of faith, we would discover that I think out of five times in the New Testament, three are translated confidence. Substance is, conf is translated either confidence or confidence. So when we look at that verse, we could actually change substance to the word confidence. And that changes the whole perspective that we have on that verse. Because now faith is the confidence of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Confidence is the exact opposite of doubt. Because doubt breeds hopelessness. When we look at the light of Christ, he, what Jesus wanted to work for people everywhere. He wanted to do something for them. When we look at the word of God several times before he performed a miracle, we find that he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. The lame walked. The deaf heard. The dumb spoke. But there was one place that he had trouble working. And that was his own town. Matthew chapter 13, verse 54 through 58 states, And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in the synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished, and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simeon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. And he did not, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. See, doubt breeds hopelessness. Jesus wanted to do lots of works. He wanted to heal the sick. He wanted to heal the lame. But there was no faith. They doubted him. We know who this guy is. He's the carpenter's son. He's not even rich. How can he have an education? We know who he is. Or maybe that is said of somebody that we grew up with. You know, they'll never be a minister. Or maybe people just don't expect him to lay hands on the sick and see.
see that and thought, we know who he is. We know his lifestyle. But what did Jesus say? A prophet is not without honor, but where? In his own country. People don't expect it. They got, we know who he is. He can't do that stuff. Doubt breeds hopelessness. He wanted to, but the Bible states people there, they just didn't believe. Because of their unbelief, Christ could not do the many miracles that he wanted. Unbelief is a killer because where there is no faith, there's no confidence. There is doubt. There is double-mindedness. Why don't we have our prayers answered sometimes? I say it's because of unbelief. We doubt it. We ask God to do it. But do we really think he's going to answer the prayer? Sometimes it's just a whole lot easier to go home and pop some Advil in than it is to have the minister lay hands and pray before us. Or maybe it's just easier to accept the death sentence of cancer than to believe that God's going to heal me. Because how many times have we even said it within ourselves or within our church congregation that, well, maybe it wasn't God's will to heal them. Well, maybe somebody doubted it somewhere. Maybe you doubt it that God wasn't able to do it. So we settle on the presumption that, well, God didn't heal them, so it must be God's will. I realize that God uses things for our reason. But when I look at the word of God when it comes to sickness, why was this man lame or was he blind from his mother's womb? Did his parents say, no, this was done that the father may be magnified. Why don't we have answers sometimes? I believe it's because we doubt whether or not God can do it. Why don't we go out and lay hands on the sick? We're at work. You're not feeling well. Would you like me to pray for you? Why don't we see people healed? We really believe that God is going to heal them. Or is it just easier to say, well, go take some time and we'll walk it off. I believe God wants to do more than we could ever dream or imagine. But we doubt whether or not he's going to do it. So we don't even step out in the first place. And our doubt breeds hopelessness. Where people could be delivered from sickness, from disease, from demons. We just sit back and we doubt and we don't even try. Unbelief breeds hopelessness. And where there is hopelessness, there is death. Because there only comes to a, there comes a point where you can only feel hopeless for so long before you just give up. The person who feels hopeless never really looks for a solution, because to them there is no solution, and hopelessness leads to death. In Second Kings chapter seven and verse one through twenty, the Bible states. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel. <coughs> In the gate of Samaria, and a land on Lord on whose, land, whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God, and said, Behold, if the Lord would make the windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eye, but thou shalt not eat thereof. And the Lord answered the man of God, reiterating, jumping down to verse 19 of the passage, and said, Now behold, if the Lord shall make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. This man doubted the word of God. 
and because of that, he was trampled at the gate of the city. Was that because of his unbelief? Or was he in the wrong spot at the wrong time? I don't know. But what I do know is the word of God, right before he dies, reiterates his warning and his response. And his doubt and his unbelief. And now there is a man who died in his unbelief at the gates of the city. Doubt breeds hopelessness and it breeds death in the end. Because if we doubt and we really don't believe the word of God, when it comes to pass, we question it. And doubt stifles the working that God wants to do in our lives. Doubt is the very opposite of faith. And God requires faith in order to work. Christ did many, many miracles. But when there weren't many miracles done, it was because of unbelief. What does God want to do through you and through this church? We love to talk about James chapter... Oh, we love to use the passage <coughs> about Christian and carnal, carnality and how you can't serve two masters at one time. And we love to use that verse, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And then how many times have you heard it preached that they go to, you can't serve God and man, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't be double-minded. But the truth of the matter is, if only we would take the passage in context. In James chapter 1, 5 through 8, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Notice, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So far, has there anything been said about sin? Has there been anything that's been discussed about worldliness? No. Let him ask of God, and it shall be given him. Talk about prayer. Don't waver. For he... But let him ask in faith. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We use that verse a lot of times in certain worldliness, carnality. The double-minded man. You can't serve God and man. But the truth of the matter is, the context we just read is prayer. Let him ask of God. Don't doubt. Don't waver. And he shall receive it. But the man who won't receive it is the one that wavers. Because he is driven like the sea and tossed. What does that mean? God, I need you to do this. Don't know if he's gonna do it, but I'm still gonna ask. Well, then it must not be God's will. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now we need to ask God believing, knowing that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, asking in faith, not wavering. In Mark chapter 5, 35 through 40, while he yet speak, speaks, referring to Jesus, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any farther? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, 
Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he that and he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and well greatly. And when he was come in, he said unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead. But sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entered in where the damsel was lying. Here we have what seems to be an impossible situation. If I remember correctly, this is Jerry's daughter, and word comes. Jesus tells him, Be not afraid, only doubt. Right? Only believe. Only believe. He didn't say doubt and believe. He didn't say question and believe. He said only believe. And they go to the house. And there you have a whole slew of people. Because in Jewish custom, there would have been hired people there to weep and wail all the body and cry. And they're mourners. And Jesus comes to the house, and there's a lot of people there. But what happens in verse 40? And they laughed him to scorn. When Jesus asked them why the damsel is not, why are they doing all this? The damsel's not dead. She's sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. What does Jesus do? Get out of here. Get out of here. Sometimes you realize as Christians, we just need to chase people away. You know what? If you're not going to pray with me and believe, then just go somewhere else. We don't have to hate them. We don't have to ridicule them. But you know what? If you're not going to believe with me in this situation and pray with me, then just go somewhere else for the time being. Jesus put everybody out but the father, the mother, and the disciples he took with. Scripture doesn't say why, but reading the first phrase of verse 40 kind of gives us a pretty good clue. If they're laughing at him, they don't believe what, that he can bring her back to life. They don't believe that Christ can do a mighty work. Why couldn't he work in his own town? Because of unbelief. Is this situation any different? Not really. The only difference was this time, Christ was able to get rid of the naysayers. He was able to get rid of the doubting disciples. I don't know. Maybe there were people in that house that actually believed the teachings of Christ, believed his words, but in this case, you know, she's dead. She ain't coming back. You know what? That's what they go somewhere else for now. Now, sometimes we just need to get rid of some people in our life in certain situations. Sometimes we just need to say, you know what? You don't believe. Just don't pray with me. Don't pray for me right now. Just go somewhere else. If you don't believe that God can do it, really, then just go somewhere else right now because the Bible states, but only ask in faith, nothing wavering. If you're going to waver, just go to the back corner for now. Sometimes it is okay to tell people, don't pray for me. If you know they're not living right, you know what? You don't need to be praying for me. You don't need to be laying hands on me. You don't need to be praying for me. It is okay to remove some people and tell them, don't pray for me under the right condition. Not that you do it in a mean way. Not that you do it in a hurtful way. But if you really, really want an answer, the Bible says, let him ask in faith. All doubt needs to be removed from our lives. Do we doubt that God will work? Do we question it? 
We know he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. But do we really believe that wholeheartedly? Because when you know something that you know that you know that you know, it doesn't matter who comes in your path or what they say. There's no changing your mind. Well, God, are you going to do that? It's been so long. No. I pray it's going to come to pass. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I don't know what's happened in this church in the past. But maybe, just maybe, there was a time when the Holy Ghost was really moving and he had people pray over the people. That God's going to fill these pews with souls. And maybe you guys haven't seen it yet. But regardless of how much time passes, do you still hold on to that, believing that God's going to bring us to pass? <clears throat> or maybe he told you something in your own life that hasn't come to fruition yet. Do you believe that it's going to happen? If we doubt, we will never see God answer the prayers will never see God perform miracles. Why don't we see people healed when we lay hands on the sick? Are we doubting? Is there any unbelief in our lives at that point in time? But let him ask in faith and nothing waver. For us as Christians, we need to make sure that we remove all the doubt from our lives. If we're ever going to see God move in this church, if we're ever going to see God move in our lives, if God's ever going to move in our community, when we pray that God's going to send a great mighty revival, do we really believe it, or do we go through the motions? When we pray for our loved ones, do we really believe that God is dealing with our hearts then and there? Or are we just going through the motions? They have free will. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. No. When we pray, God, deal with our hearts. Do we really believe that at that moment, God is dealing with our hearts? Let us pray, nothing wavering. We must remove all doubt from our lives if we're ever going to see God move in mighty ways. Regardless of what the situation looks like, there is a story told of a man who was on a farm and he found an old bucket. And there were gaps between the slats and it was an Rough shape didn't look like anything that would ever hold water ever again. There was an older gentleman with him, and he took that bucket with the rope attached and put it in the well. Several days later, they came back and filled up the bucket, and when they looked down, they saw crystal clear water that was being held in this bucket without a drop of water leaking from it. What had happened was with time, those boards were dehydrated, and by putting it in the water, it dehydrated the boards that they spilled and went back into place. And that bucket that seemed like a waste and good for nothing anymore was useful once again. As Christians, that's how we can get sometimes. We can allow doubt to shrivel us. Not be the vessel that God wants us to be. What we need to do is get into the presence of the Holy Ghost once again and let Him just water us and saturate us and remove doubt from our lives that we may once again have an increase in faith because Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 so that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God sometimes we just need to bring the Holy Ghost back into our life in a greater uh, degree than we've ever had before that way we can remove doubt because it's when we are in his presence that things change it's 
when we are in his presence, the mountain moves. It's when we are in the presence of the Holy Ghost that we are changed even farther into the image of Jesus Christ. As Sister Beth comes to the piano, this morning, may we reevaluate our lives to make sure that we are not a doubting disciple. God wants to do more than we could ever dream or imagine. He wants to use us to perform signs and wonders and miracles that just baffle us the mind of this world. Not because they make us look great in life, but they reveal to the world that there truly is a God, and He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that they could ever ask or think. My brother-in-law the other month shared a story where at the job he works at the soup kitchen, somebody asked him to pray for them. He didn't say any big specific prayer. He didn't know all the needs. But he prayed with that man, and he later heard through the grapevine that that man for years had a rare blood disease. He went to the doctor shortly after my brother-in-law prayed with him. And the doctors were astonished that his blood was perfect. There was nothing wrong with him. There was no trace of the disease. My brother-in-law knew nothing about that. He didn't even pray for that. But do you believe that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask or think? Are you ready 